see in the in the bulletin it says standing, I mean, uh, step into the water. We're not going to do that because we didn't rehearse it, so we're going to stand on the promises instead. <laughs> privilege this last week uh, on, on uh, Thursday evening, spending the evening with my cousin, uh, Michael Sims and his family. They're in from Alaska. They uh, are serving a church there in Valdez, Alaska. And uh, it's been about, what, three and a half years or so. And uh, they gave him a little bit of time off to uh, come to Texas to uh, uh uh, have some time with his family and uh, a kind of an extended vacation and uh, we got to talking about different things and and uh, he being a pastor and me being a pastor and uh, it, it was just a, a wonderful time of, of talking together and and uh, sharing with one another uh, the different blessings and and things like that and uh, we we really enjoyed our time together we were talking about at one point in our conversation 
about uh, he went through the book of Romans and he said he lost some people while he was going through that series because the book of Romans uh, touches uh, on sin and the uh, problem of sin, the cure for sin, uh, and uh, the reason that uh, we need a Savior. And so he was uh, uh, talking about sin and preaching against sin, and he uh, had some people who got offended at that. Well, we're going to start out this morning in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1, and he's going to preach against sin. He's going to talk about sin. He starts out the chapter, which remember now, that there, when he wrote this uh, down as a letter, it wasn't uh, put in chapter and verse divisions. But as we begin this morning, he says, Therefore laying aside, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Now that's quite a, a bit right there. Five different things that to, to lay aside. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And indeed, if you've tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, it is also contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, He's precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone uh, which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word, which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Great, great scripture before us. Let us pray. Dear Father, we're grateful that we have, Lord, these great promises with great understanding. Uh, Lord, the quotations from the Old Testament, Lord, and the um, uh, Lord, to uh, understand how that the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of those scriptures and has now become the chief cornerstone and also is a living stone for us as well as we are joined with him in the building of God. And we're thankful for that in Christ's name. Amen. Now, when you think about stones, think I think personally uh, that uh, they're kind of, you know, just can be laying around of no use, or you can take stones and use them uh, uh, to uh, be essential building material. And that's what we want to be. We don't want to be just a stone laying around here, you know, just kind of laying around, uh, being a stone, amen? You want to be an essential building material in the for great beauty and purpose of God. Uh, here Peter is comparing the Christian to a stone that's a valuable building material, but also to a stone that has the characteristic of life, calling us living stones. Now, of course, we all know that uh, this is uh, an analogy, but it's a, it serves a, a, a dual purpose here of understanding that a stone is something that's strong, that's a solid, that's a, a, a something that uh, uh, can be counted on as being uh, uh, faithful to be there when you need it to, uh, to be solid and strong. And so it is, that, but yet we're also living stones. We're part of the body of Christ, so we're part of the building of Christ and the body of Christ, uh, being uh, uh, living stones and it's uh, noteworthy in a spiritual sense, 
And Christ then being the chief cornerstone, and we being the building and body of Christ, uh, we're also referred to in this passage as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And so we certainly have a, a very special purpose and role, uh, even though we may be as stones rough around the edges sometimes, but God can use us and put us in places into the right place for the right purpose in the right time. And just a little side note, next year's Vacation Bible School, is uh, the theme is Concrete and Cranes. And so uh, we'll be talking, and the subject will be a building project, and uh, we'll provide a good topic and good lessons for us and decorations and all that. So we look forward to next week, uh, next year's uh, uh, Vacation Bible School. But the first thing we do now in talking about being living stones, when we start a building project, we have to first clear the land. And that's what he's doing here in talking about uh, this sin. Uh, and he, he says you, you've got to lay aside malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking in the, to push these things aside. And I kind of picture a big bulldozer coming in and clearing the land, uh, getting ready to build a, a, on a building project. And then we talk about the foundation, of course, and there's a scripture that deal with the fact that Jesus Christ himself is the foundation. And we understand that the gospel message is also the foundation and understanding of, of our faith and, and our, our uh, salvation is, is built around the fact that Jesus Christ uh, uh, came to this earth. He died, was buried, and rose again. And as we trust him for our, as our salvation, we understand that uh, 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 he being our savior, we trusting in him. And then as we partake of the communion service this morning, the Lord's Supper, as we, as we partake of this time, uh, it, it is an understanding that we look back to our foundation and to the death of Christ, understanding the price that was paid for our salvation. And so uh, there's, there's much to deal with in this passage and how appropriate it is that we have the Lord's Supper on, uh, on this particular time. Notice then, uh, uh, any time, uh, and the, even in the communion service, the Lord's Supper, we, we understand it's kind of like in, in a construction project, there comes a time when you have to sweep away the debris. You have to have a clearing uh, in any project. Uh, you can't just continue building and building and debris piling up. There has to be a time where you sweep everything out and, and uh, organize some things, take an inventory, understand, uh, get some other materials in and, and all this, that, and the other. And so that's what he's doing here in this passage of clearing away some of the debris that were in people's lives. And we'll talk about that specifically in just a moment. And then some people, as we talk about building their lives in a building project and building their lives of faith, they kind of add on uh, this, that, and the other without a master plan. You know, whatever kind of comes their way in life, they just kind of uh, uh, embrace that and add this on to their life and attach this to their life and that to their life because it's something that maybe grab their attention, it's maybe something that uh, kind of tickled their fancy or whatever the case may be, and then uh, they, they find themselves in a life that's uh, uh, crowded with all kinds of debris, all kinds of different structures and uh, different uh, things in their life, and so we have to look to Jesus as the master builder, uh, and we being the living stones in his structure, that we may find the right place and understand uh, what God is doing in our lives. To build a building of faith in, in our lives and to be part of God's building as far as God's church, God's body, God's building. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, a wonderful privilege. 
So real quickly, three uh, simple points, and that is the preparation. We see in this passage also the priesthood. He's going to talk about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ being the cornerstone and he's, uh, the priesthood. And then the proclamation that he makes in verses 9 and 10 is absolutely tremendous. So first of all, we've already kind of talked about the preparation, the, the steps we must take to get ready to build. Verse 1 uh, uh, talks about the highlights, the necessary things that must be dealt with. And I have a little theory about this. Uh, of, uh, it's, it talks about laying aside all these things of malice and deceit, hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking. And Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, we find that... Uh, uh, he likens this same kind of preparation to putting off a garment. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And it's an understanding here as you read the book of Ephesians and follow the apostle Paul and his logic that he's talking about that you need to take off some things in your, in your Christian life, the things that are hindering you, the things that uh, the old garment, he says, just discard that, put it away from you. And so it's the same kind of, of understanding here. And you see how that different passages of the scripture, you've got the writings of Paul, you've got the writings of Peter here, and you see some parallels and understand uh, uh, how that he deals with certain things in our lives. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, it's kind of the same thing. The Bible says that we should examine ourselves, he says in 1 Corinthians 11. We should take stock. We should look back on the price that was paid, the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his body, his blood, uh, and understand that these things are are, as we understand the price that was paid, we need to take stock of ourselves and cleanse ourselves uh, in these times. And so he starts out in talking about malice. Malice is wishing others ill will. It also includes wickedness. It's not a shame to break the law. You know, they, they, people that uh, justify themselves. Well, you know, I, I think I can break the law or this rule or this thing, uh, uh, that or the other because, you know, I, I'm special or, or I deserve it or, or whatever case may be. But malice is actually wishing others will. And hopefully we're not consumed uh, with uh, malice toward others, but it's still part of our sinful nature that we have to deal with. I mean, when somebody is uh, cutting you off in traffic, you don't tell that person, well, God bless you, I, I appreciate you, and I wish you well, have a, have a nice day. You know, that's not, at least, that's not in your thoughts, amen? And so uh, we all have a degree of malice in our lives, and we, we need to, he says, put this thing away, laying aside these things. And then he talks about uh, deceit. The deceit is translated guile, meaning to trick other people or manipulate them. And, and sometimes we are deceitful in our, in our lives, and we even have self-deceit going on. Where, and I, I'm convinced there's a lot of people in this world in which we live that are just self-deceived. They're just deceived. They, they, they have told themselves the lie long enough that they actually believe of themselves. And you know that there's an old saying that kind of uh, I think is, is a good thing to keep in mind. You know, a lot of times we take ourselves so serious and we think that we're the center of our universe and that's not true. We need to understand that, that uh, uh, we can be deceived and uh, um, there's some things that I think all of us could be vulnerable about and deceived about. And we need to uh, be mindful of that. And then the next thing that is dealt with is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, 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 and it's similar to deceit, to pretend that you're something that you're not. 
And uh, uh, there's something that I have personally observed, and that is people that are real legalistic, that they have all the, the right rules, and they think that everybody ought to follow their rules, and, uh, uh, you know, they kind of judge others according to their, their little list of rules and this, that, and the other. I find in, in nearly every case uh, that there's a lot of hypocrisy in that. Now, that's just my observation, but, uh, but uh, we, we all have to be mindful of this thing of hypocrisy. And then it, it talks about en envy. Uh, and a lot of times we, 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 uh, we, we envy other people that are, are going through uh, the things that, and we think, well, hey, they, they, they got it made. They got it made, and how come I don't have it the way they have it? How come I don't have the things they have? And this and envy. And then evil speaking is self-explanatory. It's translated backbiting in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, we, we understand that, that uh, uh, we, we are to speak, uh, well, it, you know, it's the old saying that goes like this, if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say it at all, amen? Evil speaking, put those things away. So now, I have a little theory about why that he leaves off here, because as he's listing sins, you could talk about lust and greed and and. Uh, all kinds of other things that you could talk about, uh, fleshly sins and things like that. And But I think that in understanding, as he begins to list these things, uh, the, as I have uh, experienced in my own life, when God begins to name sin, this is enough to deal with right here. Amen? That's enough to pray about these five things. But notice, uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit can also bring to your mind the different specific things that maybe are your besetting sin. And um, if chocolate is a sin, then I am a sinner, okay? But, uh, but I, I think, you know, you have to understand that we all have uh, weaknesses. We all have things that we are drawn to. And those are things that, not excuses at all, those are things that we must uh, uh, bring before God and let God deal with these things in our lives. So he's saying, put these things, lay those things aside, but then notice what the, what the antidote is, and that is God's word in verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, the understanding is built into this, that then if you begin to grow spiritually and mature, you'll be able then to overcome these things. You'll be stronger spiritually and more mature. And, and so he's saying that uh, desire the sincere milk of the word, the pure milk of the word, and it's understood as a natural desire, just like a baby craves milk, the believer should have an appetite for God. And so does then... The purity of the word of God is understood. And in fact, in the previous chapter last week, we covered it in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And so we understand the word of God is, is not uh, corrupted and, and uh, it's not man's attempt to manipulate uh, uh, mankind. Or, or to start religion, it is, it is God's word. And we know it's God's word because it's so brutally honest about even people like Peter and uh, Paul and David and, and Moses and all these different ones. Uh, we understand it's so brutally honest about them. Uh, it, it's understood that it, it is indeed God's word. Notice then in a few verses we'll talk about the living stones, but the word of God is also living and active in the believer's life. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So as we're talking about a living stone, we also talk about the living word, the living scriptures uh, that are before us. 
And so these things are all important. So God's word imparts grace to make it desirable as well as helpful. Verse number three, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. It tastes good. Now you say, well, some of it don't taste that well. It's kind of like medicine. Yes, it is. So I agree with you. But uh, uh, for the most part, the word of God tastes good. We have a hunger for it. It, it fulfills a need spiritually for us that nothing else can, uh, can fill that void. So that brings us not only to the preparation, but we come to the priesthood now. The idea of being living stones carries with it a teaching of position, purpose, and being productive. As we talked about earlier, we're not stones just laying around, but we're strategically placed. God has strategically placed us in his body, in his building, for a particular purpose. Uh, you know, you, you, certain building materials and uh, makes the framework, but then when you get specific about the uh, areas of your kitchen or your, your bathroom or your bedroom and or living room, different things that come to mind of, of, of certain things of building materials that you need specifically for those rooms. Well, think about it as God is a master builder. He has each and every one of us personally designed and he, and he chips away at us and, and uh, 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 cuts off the rough edges. Hopefully he does that. Uh, we let him do that. And uh, to, to come, and so in, in verse 4, coming to him, notice, first of all, it's Christ that's pictured as a living stone, Re rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And then, then as Christ is put into perspective as being a stone, a living stone, then we also, verse 5, as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer of spiritual sacrifices. And so Peter, who his name means a small stone, a small rock, a pebble, he's giving us an analogy of Christ being the chief cornerstone and us being built together with him and we're joined in so many different ways. Think about that. When you talk about a building, you talk about how that everything in a building of the structure, now we're talking about the actual structure of a building, everything is joined with something else. That's the secret. That's an understanding of, of how you build a building. You don't just put a wall up without any, uh, it being attached to something. You don't put the roof up for sure, uh, uh, the uh, trusses, I don't care if the engineer trusts us or not. You don't just put them up in the air. They have to have some support. And so it is that everything is connected in a building. And as a body of Christ and as a building of Christ, we're all connected together. And there's so many other analogies in the Bible. We're children of God. We're the bride of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We're the saints of God. We've been given the Holy Spirit, and so therefore our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we, we are, are given a much understanding of, in this passage, of our standing and our position. In the building, Christ, is, of course, is the foundation, but he's also the chief cornerstone, which means he's the point of reference that everything uh, is measured back to him. Now... <clears throat> Uh, I've been involved in some building projects before, and uh, I don't to claim to be a plumber or a carpenter, okay? But I have been involved in some building projects and understand that if something isn't square or if it isn't plumb, uh, then you, you have some real challenges, some real problems. And so that's where it comes back to this thing of Christ being the cornerstone. When you set the cornerstone, Everything references back to that point. The measurements of the building, the, 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 uh, wh whether it's square or whether it's a plum or whatever the case may be. And so, uh, and it's a very clear analogy that anybody can understand. And so, uh, in, in the building, Christ being the foundation, 
But notice then in the priesthood, everything relates back to God as well. As priests, we have direct access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great high priest, and even our bodies can become a living sacrifice. Romans 12 verse 1 talks about our bodies, says, I beseech you or beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And some people try to use the priesthood of the believer to try to say, well, you know, I, I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. You know, I, I'm a totally, as a, as a priest before God, I, I don't need anything or anyone. Uh, there's no guidelines whatsoever. That's not true. Amen. So the Old Testament scriptures are quoted in this passage for the purpose of revealing Israel as the cornerstone for the purposes of God, but also to reveal when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, came and he would fulfill and be the chief cornerstone. And it's understood as you, as you uh, verse 7, therefore to you who believe, He's precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And then the, lastly, the proclamation, verses 9 and 10. I love this proclamation that's made. In verse 9, your chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And so we, we find our identity and our purpose. Then we talk, he talks about the mercy of God. He said you were a people that, uh, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so uh, it's an understanding that now we're placed over here in this category as living stones, as the people of God, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, all these things that God has uh, 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 said to signify what we are, to identify uh, who we are and what we're to be doing. Notice then, it's for the purpose of praise unto God. As uh, God's mercy has allowed us the opening to partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. And it, it, it's, it's because of God's mercy, not because of our goodness. Anytime you even pray to God, well, uh, much less praise him, but if you pray to God or praise God, you don't do it based upon the foundation of, well, I'm a good person and so therefore I can partake. No, or I'm a good person, now I can praise God. No, you do it based upon the fact of, of I, I've received the mercy of God. And because of what he has done for me, he has made me worthy. I am now what he says I am. I am a royal priesthood. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a holy nation, uh, a part of this, and uh, God's own special people. And so we understand that. And it's with that approach that we come. And so we're his body, we're his building. We are the living stones that make up what God has uh, on this earth as, as his body, his building, his plan, his purpose. Let's stand to our feet this morning. They come with a hymn of invitation in just a moment. Let's pray, dear Father, where we ask, Lord, that he would uh, speak to our hearts, especially, Lord, concerning maybe some kind of besetting sin, Lord, that's in our lives. Lord, and then as, as a church, as a body, may we also examine ourselves as a church. Lord, are we doing everything that we do and saying everything that we say based upon the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection? understanding the sacrifice and how, how precious indeed it is. So Lord, help us to take all that into account as we observe the Lord's Supper this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing a...
a hymn of invitation at this time as we prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's table this morning. What number? 576. Take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you as we do that in just a few moments as well. But, but allow God to speak to our hearts as we sing this morning. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Thank you. You may be seated. And the deacons will come forward and will prepare the table as an understanding of what God has done, what God is doing, and what God is going to do. Think about it in terms of that this morning as they come uh, to uh, understand that this is not just looking to the past, even though it does indeed do that. But it also looks into our hearts presently, our condition, and then looks then yet to the future as far as what God is doing uh, or will do yet in the future as he comes for us one of these days. And of course, you know the elements here being the bread, the unleavened bread, which pictures the sinless body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the the cup, which means his blood, which was shed, the pure blood of Christ, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so as the Lord Jesus Christ was in the upper room with his disciples, he brought before them the bread, which was unleavened bread. And uh, we believe it was probably the, what we would call the matzah bread. And he broke it in their midst, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And they had a word of uh, thanksgiving that was prayed before they partook of that. And that's how we do it as well. We follow the pattern according to what the Lord Jesus Christ did as he instituted the Lord's Supper uh, among his disciples. And as the church then followed that in the book of 1 of, uh, Corinthians. And so we read here, and as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a word of prayer of thanksgiving uh, to uh, the Lord for uh, his body that was broken for our sin. And I'm going to ask Brother Vance Buras if he could pray for us at this time, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, to uh, open hearts and minds to receive what you have given to us. Lord, to remember even 2,000 years ago, Lord, that you uh, shed your blood and gave your body to be broken, Lord, that we might have eternal life, Lord, and trust in you. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you. We pray that our hearts would be open to the truth, that you might guide us in everything we do, and you would get the glory from us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Jesus spoke these words to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body. Likewise, he took the cup and blessed it and gave it to them, explaining to them that this was the blood of the New Testament for the remission of sin. I'm going to ask Brother Walton McMillan, if he would, to pray a word of thanks for the blood of Christ, which taketh away the sin of the world. took the cup and gave it thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins and I say to you I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the time or the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom and so it always points us forward to looking forward to the time when we will be with, with God in his kingdom. And the understanding is basically that Christ will be the one serving us. Just like he's, as he washed the disciples' feet, I think he's, you say, well, how's that going to be possible? Well, in heaven, amen, God can, can serve all the millions and millions of, of, of believers, of saints of God, he can serve us, and we have all the time we need anyway, amen? Can you imagine what a service that's going to be? What a, what a tremendous time of understanding the very one who became the, the sacrifice for us and gave himself will serve us in that day, and he will drink it new with us in, our father's, in his Father's kingdom. What a blessing it will be, amen? Let us stand together. And be dismissed in a word of prayer. What a privilege it is to partake of the Lord's table. Amen. What a privilege it is to do this. And think about it. Uh, that, that it brings us 
always back to the right thing, the main thing. And it, it keeps us in the right direction, always, always. And we're thankful for that. God, God has a way of doing that uh, in, in our lives and in our, especially in our, in our service here. All right. Well, let's be uh, dismissed in a word of prayer at this time. I'm going to ask Brother Charlie Barnes, if he would, to dismiss us in prayer, please. Well, Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful, Lord, for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. Lord, just to pause from our busy schedules and reflect on what a sacrifice, Lord, you made for us at the cross. Forgive us now the many ways that we failed, Lord. These things we ask in Jesus' precious name.